Good afternoon, everyone. We're happy to see you all here. Um, my name is Lisi. I'm a gerontologist with South Dakota State University Extension. Um, we're excited to have you here with us today for our first coffee break with the Food and Families team. For the next six weeks, we will be featuring various topics on Tuesdays at 1 Mountain to Central. Um, <clears throat> To kick off the series, Megan and Hope will be covering the topic of food preservation and the Master Food um, Preserver Volunteer Pilot Program. Some questions were submitted with registrations to be, to be addressed during this session, but if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box. There's a little button at the bottom of your screen that says chat. Type your questions there at any time. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. Before I introduce Hope and Megan, would like each of you to put your name and location and how you heard about this series in the chat box. And we already have one comment. Today is a great day to start thinking about gardening. I concur. Um, it's beautiful outside today. Well, I'm in Rapid City. So while you're typing, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers. Um, we have with us today Megan Erickson. Uh, she's a nutrition field specialist based in the Aberdeen Regional Center. Megan shares her knowledge as a registered dietitian nutritionist to support individuals and families in lifestyle balance with healthy nutrition and physical activity practices. Hope Klein is our health education and food safety field specialist on the Brookings campus. Um, Hope serves South, Dakota, South Dakotans by helping individuals and communities implement healthy living interventions as a certified physiologist. Her programming focuses on exercise, healthy communities and her knowledge on food preservation. Um, so we've got Rhonda from Piedmont. Welcome Rhonda, we're delighted that you're here. So before we kick off with giving up the microphone to Hope and Megan, let's do a little poll. So we're gonna start out by um, asking your knowledge of safe home food preservation practices. So on the screen, you should see a poll and you can rate yourself as not confident, a little confident, somewhat confident, confident, or very confident. So we'll give you a few minutes. I think it got reset. Give you about 15 more seconds. So we're going to show our results on the screen. Um, somewhat confident is the um, most common answer. So next question, um, what's your ability to follow safe food preservation practices? And I'm gonna go ahead and launch this poll as well. And again, it starts at not confident to very confident. I'll give you about 15 more seconds. All righty. Uh -oh. So let me share the results. Um, most of you are somewhat are confident. So we have got one 
Um, last poll for you. And it's your knowledge about where to get safe, research tested um, recipes for preserving food at home. Please rate your level of confidence. Sorry, my cat may serenade you in the background. Right, I'm gonna give you another 10 seconds. What you doing, buddy? I'm gonna head in the polling and share the results. Um, most folks indicate they're somewhat confident. We really appreciate you sharing um, your perspective on these different questions. And I'm gonna turn the session now over to Hope and Megan. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, so like Lisey mentioned, my name is Hope. And I'm going to be kind of kicking us off today. So thank you guys um, for participating in the poll and for jumping on and spending the afternoon with us. I know I have my coffee sitting next to me and hopefully some of you are also enjoying um, some coffee or tea or however you um, take in your caffeine. <laughs> Um, so before we're able to preserve, we of course need to be able to have the produce or, um, you know, meat to be able to preserve. So to kick us off, I just want to first ask how many of us garden. Um, if you have your video on, you can raise your hand if you're a gardener or um, you can put it, oh, got a, got a few people responding right away. Um, otherwise, we encourage you to put it in the chat box. We want to have this be as interactive as we possibly can. Oh, and I see some people using the um, emotion. So I'm seeing um, some thumbs up on your screen. So that's awesome. So um, when we, or when you guys went through the registration process of registering for this um, series that we're having, some questions that you guys submitted were gardening specific. Megan and I are not the gardening experts for SD2 Extension. So we didn't want to spend too much time talking about gardens, but we also didn't want to leave those of you with those questions with nothing. Um, so I just kind of wanted to touch on a couple of things to maybe help guide you as you're maybe getting reinvested into gardening or maybe gardening for the first time. So the first thing that I kind of want to cover in regards to gardening is how big of a garden should you have? And you really need to ask yourself a couple of questions. And the first is, how big of a garden can you have that's manageable for you? If you plant a garden that's too big, you're gonna feel overwhelmed and you're not gonna enjoy gardening. So something key to remember is that it's always better to be proud of a small garden than to be frustrated and overwhelmed by a big one. Um, so for beginners, it's really recommended that a 16 foot by a 10 foot garden is kind of the ideal way to go. And then of course, just documentation and experience of how did that 16 by 10 foot garden go for you? Um, you know, you can always add on next year or make it a little bit smaller. And then the second question to ask yourself is what is it that you want to preserve? So uh, maybe you've really enjoyed canning green beans. So just making sure that you account for, all right, how many green beans do I want to plant so that I can not only eat some fresh, but I can also have enough to be able to preserve and can it. There is um, a couple articles wrote by our specialist that focuses a lot on gardening and gardening in South Dakota. So I'm gonna share a link to that gardening article. I'm gonna put it in the chat box so that you guys are able to click on it and maybe leave it open in your computer just so um, you can reference that after today's session is over. All right, sorry, trying to figure out my mute button. <laughs> You'd think I would be all um, used to Zoom. So Hope and I, like um, Lacey mentioned, Hope mentioned, we are so excited that you all took time out of your afternoon and hopefully for the next five weeks or over the course of the six weeks, um, you can look forward to having a conversation with us or joining us at two o'clock central each time um, to kind of learn about different topics that our food and families um, are specialized in. 
So another to kind of kick off another conversation is a great question we received was, um, what do I actually need to get started? So if you're new to canning, um, you know, what do you even need? What, what tools do you need to, in order to start canning? Um, so the answer may be variables depending on how you want to preserve and what you want to preserve. Um, and we'll kind of cover more specifics as we dive into the different food preservation methods, such as water bath, um, if you want to pressure can, if you want to freeze. Um, but the basics may include uh, a canner, a cutting board, um, knives, because you'll want to prepare your produce according to the recipe, uh, jar lids and rings, and a canning kit. And Hope is gonna share a picture of what is kind of included in a canning kit. And you can find, you know, if you, you can find several of these items, <clears throat> excuse me, at Walmart, on Amazon, but this kit ranges anywhere. I think you can find this exact kit at Walmart for about $13, um, but has a jar lifter, a tongs, um, a headspace um, measuring tool on the bottom there, a funnel so you keep your jars clean when you're putting your food into the jars, and then a handy dandy timer. Um, so those are just kind of the basics to kind of get you started on what you need uh, for canning. And again, reminder, if you have any specific questions about what Hope and I are talking about, um, please feel free to um, type in the chat box. Great. I know that canning kit when Megan and I have been doing different workshops has been um, really unique and helpful to individuals. It maybe had some tools in it that they just weren't aware of. Um, all right, the next thing that we want to talk about before we really dive into the specifics on water bath canning, pressure canning, freezing, and drying is just that we wanted to go over the basics. So I know based on different questions that were submitted, we're going to be answering a few of them right off of the bat. So the first one is um, an update that I think a lot of people who have been avid canners are relieved to learn when they're speaking with Megan or myself. And that's that you no longer have to go through the sterilization process of jars and lids. So previously it was highly recommended that you needed to heat your jars and sterilize your lids prior to canning. So people would, um, you know, maybe heat them up in the oven or heat them up in a crock pot to just get them sterile. So that's something that is no longer deemed necessary. Of course, there's always the continued encouragement to um, wash your jars with soap and water right, right before canning them. Um, just to make sure they're nice and clean. Um, so this is a process or a step that's no longer required unless you are following a recipe that processes 10 or fewer minutes. So sometimes there might be pickles that you have to water bath can and it's only for 10 minutes. So for in that stance, you would want to um, go ahead and move forward with sterilizing your jars and lids. And other people, they maybe boil their lids prior to canning, and that's something that you do not want to do. You want to heat them, so it might be that you have, you pour hot water on your lids to just help sterilize them or keep them clean. It's not going to hurt them if you just use hot water, but if you're boiling them or pouring boiling water onto the lids, that can actually damage the rubber gasket on the lid, and it prevents a sealing um, from taking place. So you don't want to use boiling water, you just want to make sure that you're using hot water. Um, a question that we got in was um, covering the specific headspace for different types of items that you are canning. Um, so maybe if you have a pen and pencil next to you, you might want to jot this down. But the guidelines for headspace is for jelly products, so jams and jellies, you want a fourth inch of headspace, so that's very minimal. And then for fruits, um, tomatoes or pickles, you want a half inch of headspace. And then for your low acid foods like your green beans or your meats, you need one inch to one and a quarter inch. That one varies just a little bit based on the recipe that you are using. And then I'm gonna share my screen again. So I'm gonna be doing this um, a couple times during today's presentation. Um, the next thing I want to cover is adjusting for altitude. 
So I feel like this, let me move to presentation slides so you guys don't have to see all those text box. So I feel like this is the next thing that people learn the most when they're going through a canning workshop is the need to adjust for altitude. So this is going, what you're seeing now is adjusting for altitude if you are water bath canning. So when you're water bath canning, if your elevation where your home is at, wherever it is that you're preserving your food, is above 3,000 feet sea level, you need to add 10 minutes to your processing time. So let's say that you're canning green beans um, and it's a 20 minute processing time, you would actually have to do a 30 minute processing time. Um, and then those individuals, like I know myself, I'm at about 1700 feet. I just have to add five minutes to my processing time. So I'd have to do my green beans for 25 minutes instead of 20. And then um, for pressure canning, it's a little bit different. Instead of adding time, you actually just add pounds of pressure to your pressure canner. Uh, so this chart's a little more overwhelming just because it depends on if you have a weighted gauge pressure canner or a dial gauge pressure canner. Um, because the weighted gauge, you can only adjust in five pound increments, whereas the dial gauge, um, you watch the needle on the dial as your pressure builds up in your canner. So you can move to that 11 pounds of pressure, 12 pounds of pressure, or 13 pounds of pressure. So this is highly important simply because water boils at different temperatures at different sea levels. So this is a really key factor in preserving your food in a safe and healthy way. Um, so if you need to check your altitude just to see where you're at, this is something that you're able to Google really easily um, and um, find it at um, very minimal work on your part. So that's something really important that just takes about, you know, 20 seconds to quick pull that up and see what adjustments you need to make um, for safe canning practices for you and your family. The last little basic I'm going to cover before we really dive in deep is shelf life. That was a question that we had received. What is, what, how long are my canned goods good for once they are canned? The guidelines is to um, consume your foods within 18 months. So make sure that you're labeling your jars appropriately once you have them canned um, and make sure that you're storing them properly. So you want to be able to store them in a cool, um, dark location. Access to sun or access to heat um, really can, um, speed up, expedite, that's the word I was looking for, expedite the process of your food deteriorating. All right, um, so that was just kind of a few basics that Megan and I wanted to cover before we got moving into talking specifics about food preservation. Um, I don't see any questions that have came in, so I'm going to pass it over to Megan to dive deep into water bath canning. All right, so water bath canning. And we had several questions on water bath canning. Um, and one of the questions that came up of, okay, what is the easiest method of canning? Is it water bath canning? Is it pressure canning? You know, that's gonna be really big, a personal preference. Someone may really love water bath canning and think it's super easy and someone just may love, all they do is pressure canning and the more experience that you get, it's, become, it's gonna become easier for you. So again, there's really no um, exact answer for that, but it's a personal preference and obviously water bath canning is gonna be maybe take less time. So people may think that it is a little bit easier, um, but again, personal preference. So the great thing is, is to, in order to water bath can, you really don't need to go out and buy a water bath canner. Um, if you have a large stock pot, um, a pot with a lid that's deep enough so that at least one inch of boiling water can cover the tops of your jars, you can use it as a water bath canner. So you don't have to go out and buy a special piece of equipment. That's the great thing. Um, you would need to purchase a rack to put at the bottom of your, pot, of your pot so that your jars are not in direct contact with the bottom of your part. Just because if the jars are directly on the bottom of the pot, we don't want the jars to break um, if they become too hot. We also want even circulation of that heat. So with the jars raised a little bit with that rack, it can, the water and the heat can evenly distribute around the jars. 
So, um, so take a look to see what you have at your house before going out and buying one. You may already have a pot um, that is used. I grew up canning with my grandma and we had, if those that are, you know, avid canners, we had the blue enamel canner, water bath canner. Um, I think she still has what we canned for when I was a little girl. Um, but you know, they do make some different ones. So again, kind of decide what you're canning and kind of figure out how big, you know, how big of one that you need. All right. So does anyone know, um, when you should use a water bath canner? Is it, should we use a water bath canner? Can we use it for any fruit and vegetable? Are there certain foods? Does anyone know when you should use a water bath canner? And again, if you um, want to type pickles, yep. If you want to type in the chat box, or if we can, there we go. Okay. Food has high acid foods. You guys are good. Maybe I don't need to talk on this. <laughs> yes, with high acid or acidified foods, such as someone mentioned pickles, um, your fruits, typical fruits, so apricots. Um, plums, apples, peaches, pears, um, tomatoes. You know, tomatoes are kind of a, I'll touch on tomatoes in a little bit, but they're kind of a, a tricky vegetable. They kind of fall on that borderline. Um, so we'll come back, remind me, we'll come back to, to uh, we'll talk about what you need to do to tomatoes to make sure that you're canning them safely when you want a water bath can. <clears throat> um, Another question that Hope and I got, and this is my favorite fruit to can. Um, someone who registered asked or said that, you know, they were really disappointed in the quality of their canned peaches and asked for some help. And I love canning peaches and peaches are my favorite to eat in the middle of winter because it just reminds me of summer. So Hope is going to kind of talk about two different methods. Um, that you can can and how to pack peaches and hopefully that can help solve some problems and make them a little bit more tasty for you. Yeah, and I echo Megan. Um, while I'm canning peaches, they're maybe not my favorite just because it's kind of a process. Um, but yes, they're the best to eat and my family just devours them so fast. So whether it's with peaches or anything else that you're choosing to preserve, there's two different packing style methods. So there's the raw pack and the hot pack, and they are basically exactly what they sound like. So the raw pack would just be um, if I blanched my peaches, I peeled the skin off of them, um, cut them into slices, and then put them in the jar for processing. And the hot pack would be um, if I blanched, peeled, cut, and then actually um, boil them or simmer them. Um, I can't remember exactly what the time is for peaches because it varies a bit by each produce item, but let's say you have to like simmer them for four minutes. Um, so you heat them up before you put them in the jar. And um, I grew up canning with my dad my entire life. So when I took over this role for my job, I would call him and be like, oh my gosh, do you know about hot packing? Because we never did it. And he just was like, it's an extra step. You don't need to do it. It's true, you don't need to do it, but I decided to test it out with my peaches. So I um, canned half of my peaches raw pack, and then I canned the other half hot pack. And initially I thought it was a complete waste of time because um, to the eye, I couldn't see any differences when they were freshly canned. But over the long term, a couple months later, I could tell. So I had labeled each of my lids, which were raw pack, which ones were hot pack. And the hot pack preserved their color better, so they look more appealing. But not only that, they taste so much better than the cold, or the raw pack. Uh, you know the raw pack, it's like, oh yeah, they're okay, I can tell it's a peach. And the hot pack, like they're sweet and they taste very, very good. So now I've actually moved to um, hot packing all of my fruits. Um, I don't do it like with my green beans or anything like that, I just haven't tried that yet. Uh, but with peaches, I would highly recommend doing the hot pack. Um, the sweetness is preserved so much better. So to whoever had that question, I hope this helps you out. Um, and my ratio for what I pack my peaches in, I just do a sugar water um, mix. So I kind of make my own juice mix. And I do a one to four ratio. So I do one cup of sugar per four cups of water. 
Um, and I heat that up and then add some to the jar. Um, and I don't like anything super sweet. So that's really perfect for me and my family. It's not overwhelming. Are there any additional questions on that before uh, Megan keeps moving forward with water bath canning? All right. Oh, how long do I cook them? I'm gonna look that up while Megan finishes talking because I can't remember exactly where or how long it is, but I know exactly where to find it, Debbie. So I will put it in the chat box in just a second. Perfect. Yes, uh, it's another step, but you know, you already have the mess, you already have the pots out, heat up your sugar water solution, boil them, and it's really not, I don't think it's, I bet it's less than five minutes. Hope's gonna prove me wrong, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's less than five minutes. But another really popular food that people like to water bath can is preserving jelly and jams. And this has been, you know, a lot of people recommend, um, request jam and jelly workshops. And someone asked, how do you get the jelly to set correctly? You know, and that's kind of a common, common thing where you get all of your jams and jellies done and they're either still soft or they have like a watery liquid or they just haven't fully set correctly. And there's a lot of different troubleshooting that we can do, um, but you know, they can be tricky, but I, I enjoy doing jams and jellies. Um, but one hint is to make sure that you're following a tested recipe and not to take any shortcuts um, or to extend any time. So if it says, you know, to vigorously boil for one minute, make sure that you're not, oh, 30 seconds is fine, or oh, let's go a little bit longer just to make sure I got that extra boil. Because overcooking the fruit, this can lower, so if you overcook the fruit, it lowers the gelling capacity of the pectin. So you're kind of removing the pectin of that fruit. And that pectin is super important in jams and jellies because it helps to set that jam and jelly. So if we're boiling the fruit too long, it removes that pectin. So you're not going to get the best quality of that um, jelly, let's see, how can I say that? Jelly jelly. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, if you undercook, um, so if you don't boil as long, it can kind of cause insufficient concentration of the sugar. So there's kind of two different ways. Um, and you want to make sure that you cook at a rapidly, you know, high temp, because that's going to help jelly, the jam and jelly, jelly. And it's a hard word to say, <laughs> jelly bean. Um, and also you want to avoid making too large of a batch. You know, make what the recipe calls. I know sometimes it's so easy, like, oh, I'm just going to double or triple this batch. That way it's all done in one, in one load. Kind of avoid doing that. Um, and just do your recipes specific to um, a lot of recipes are maybe like four to, four to six um, half pint jars. Um, and another trick is to make sure that you let the jars sit on the counter for at least 12 hours. Um, you want to let them rest. You don't want to touch them and move them because that will help with the processing of making sure that your jams and jellies are um, not soft or, you know, soft in their setting. So those are kind of some tips. And there's so many different recipes out there. Um, there's a lot more reduced sugar jams and jellies. Um, there's different syrups, there's different juices. Um, yes, so some of choke cherry, those must have been in, those must have been really hot last fall because we had lots of calls on choke cherry jelly and jam and syrup. Um, they just must have had a really good season. So yes, choke cherry jelly and syrup. Um, with the choke cherries, you have to, and we can, um, once I'm done talking, I can look up a recipe that um, we recommended, but choke cherries are tricky because you have to remove the pits, um, you have to juice them. There's a lot of different steps um, for choke cherry jelly and syrups, but I can definitely um, find a recipe and post that in the chat box for you all. Um, another, we had a couple questions on pickle recipes. Um, I don't know if anybody has a good, you know, there's lots of different ways that you can do pickle recipes. There's refrigerator pickles. Um, there's, <clears throat> excuse me, 
there's pickle recipes that you can water bath can. Hope, did you have any specific um, comments that you wanted to say on pickles? Um, yes, but first I'm gonna jump back to Debbie's question because I was just typing it and it will just be easier for me to say it. So everyone pause on the pickles and go back to the peaches. Um, so for the peaches, if you're going to hot pack, it says just until heated through. So they recommend um, not filling like a pot with the juices too full. So it might just be that you're heating them for about two minutes just so they can get warmed up. Um, and the other advantage to hot packing, sorry, I'm completely going back to my topic, but the other advantage to hot packing versus raw packing is that when you hot pack your food, since you're kind of pre-cooking it, it actually shrinks your product a little bit so you can fit more in each jar versus the raw pack. So if you're doing large batch canning, um, that's advantageous because you can get done a little bit faster. And if you're feeding a family, you can fit more in each jar. So Debbie, I hope that answers your question. And if you have a follow-up question, go ahead and let me know. Um, and then Matt, I just saw your question come through. The shelf life is going to be the same whether you raw pack or you hot pack. So it's still going to be that 18 month time period. Um, okay, jumping back to the pickling. Sorry, Megan. <laughs> um, I don't have a specific pickling recipe. The question that came through um, really seemed like it was trying to be geared toward um, maybe canning pickles with kids. Um, so that's just hard. It depends on what age the child is and a lot of different factors. So kind of a go-to that Megan and I lean into is the National Center for Home Food Preservation. Um, so you can kind of see a screenshot of their home screen and then the link right there. So that's just short for National Center for Home Food Preservation. So if you go to that link, um, there's going to be options to the left and it says, how do I, and then you click on either like can, dehydrate, pickle, dry. Um, so this is a really good evidence-based resource to lean into. And I did check out the pickle recipes that they offer. And they do have um, like five or six different ones based on if you want like sweet pickles, a dill pickle, um, and they're really straightforward. So I thought that this would be a really good resource for um, who, want, who asked that question. Awesome. Peaches, pickles. Go pears. No, I'm just kidding. Um, back to the choke cherry jelly. Um, I did find is, you know, when you are boiling, you'll boil the fruit down and then you'll um, strain it through a cheesecloth. One thing to do when extracting juice from choke cherries is not to crush the seeds. The seeds. Um, the seeds contain a cyanide forming compound that can kind of cause illness if eaten in large amounts. So it is recommended not to um, make sure that you're just not crushing the seeds when you are re, um, straining the fruit in like a cheesecloth. Um, so that was choke cherries. All right, and Hope and I, we do have a guide to water bath canning. We're not gonna dive into exact specifics just to kind of save on time. We have a lot of topics that we wanna cover. Um, but Hope just shared on our screen our guide to water bath canning publication. So this kind of goes over again, highlights the high acid foods. Again, remember your altitude, using safe recipes, and then it will go, it will help guide you step by step on the steps of water bath canning that you can apply to um, your fruits or your foods that you are water bath canning. So that is just another, another resource that you guys can go to. All right, so that is water bath canning. Um, we're gonna shift gears now and go and touch on pressure canning. So unless anybody has any other specific questions on water bath canning. All right. All right, Hope, take it away. All right, pressure canning. Um, so, First, something that's really important to note is that for both water bath canning and pressure canning, you need to have a canner that is no more than four inches wider in diameter than the element that it's been heated on. So if you take your canner and you set it on your stove top and you're hanging off by um, more than two inches on both sides, then your heating element is not big enough for your canner. Um, so that's really important to know um, just because you're not gonna get 
good enough heat distribution throughout your entire canner to get the heat to those jars and to be able to kill off the harmful bacteria that is present um, that you need to do to be able to make it be preserved safely. And that's also really important if you have a glass stove top. So if you go to our food preservation page at SDS or at Extension, our extension website, um, there's also a publication on a guide to smooth stovetop canning. So if you have a gl glass stovetop, there are a few um, key things to keep in mind before you can on those stovetops. Um, so I'm just going to ask you to go there if you have questions on that, or at the end of this, if we have more questions, we're happy to go back and answer questions about the glass stovetop. Okay. Um, so a pressure canner is a heavy duty piece of equipment. Um, it has a vent, it has a pressure gauge, and it has a gasket that are built into it that aid in building up pressure within the pot. Um, so who knows when you use a pressure canner? So we said the water bath canner is for the high acid foods. What about the pressure canner? Meats, that's correct. Beans, yes. All right, so meats and beans, uh, perfect, exactly. Those need, you need to use a pressure canner for those food items. It's going to be whenever you have a low acid food. Um, so tomatoes flirt that line. I saw that someone put in a comment on that. So Megan and I will make sure to circle back around to tomatoes. I just don't wanna jump in there now and um, be, get everyone confused, including myself. Um, so low acid foods contain bacterial spores that can contain toxins. And these toxins are able to survive a temperature in a water bath canner. So your water bath canner can heat um, the food inside of it up to 212 degrees, which is going to be, you know, the temperature of boiling water for the most part. So this is why pressure canning is required for food safety for those low acid foods, because pressure canners heat foods through the steam and the pressure that is built up within them. So inside of your pressure canner, it can actually get up to 240 degrees. So that's why it's really important to note the difference between water bath canning and pressure canning and which method to use for um, whatever it is that you're wanting to, pro to preserve. So some other low acid foods include like okra, carrots, um, squash, asparagus, corn, um, any other kind of meats, you know, your beef, your venison, um, chicken, or fish. Um, so a question that we got specifically, um, and I saw a few people, more than one person had asked it, was that they wanted us to cover canning meats. Um, so I'm going to just go over some basics, and then I ask you to put your questions in the chat box so I can answer your specific questions on canning meats, because I know this is a hot topic in the world of food preservation for sure. Um, so if you haven't tried canned meats, um, or if you're kind of freaked out by them, because I know a lot of people, when they hear that I can meat and eat them, they're like, oh, it looks so gross. Yeah, it might look kind of gross, but it's the most tender product that you'll ever get. It's so good. It's great to have in soups or stews. Um, we've used it in stir fry before. For meats like beef, venison, or lamb, you want to cut it into strips or chunks, just based on how you think you're going to use your canned meat. Um, so if you know you're going to use it for stews, you probably don't want it in strips. You probably want to cut it into chunks. Um, and then make sure that your chunks are appropriately sized so they can fit inside of your quart or pint sized jar easily. If you're preserving wild game, so uh, my husband is a hunter, so we can venison a couple times a year. And some key tricks I've learned with wild game specifically is to trim off visible fat and that helps to avoid off flavors. And when you're canning leaner cuts of meat like venison, you want to add in animal fat. So we actually added pork fat because it aids in the preservation process because deer is very lean. And then it actually adds quite a bit of flavor to the end result. So um, there, there's kind of different guidelines on like how much um, meat to fat ratio you put in. Usually we try to stick with like um, a fourth of our we do quart jars, so we'll do like a fourth of our jar is the pork fat and then the rest is the venison. On our website, we do have a couple of articles. There's one titled canning meats and then there's another one titled canning fish. Um, so that will kind of lay it out for you. So if you utilize the pressure canning publication that Megan and I have put together as well as the article on canning meats or canning fish, 
um, that should be almost all of the information that you need. And then um, you're able to find Megan and my information on the website if you need um, more specific questions answered. And I see that the chat is blowing up. So um, hopefully I answered some questions, but let's see what else we have. Thank you. Good. I'll move into tomato, um, touch on tomatoes now. Um, so tomatoes are, um, they're kind of on that border. If you look at an acidity level or a, a pH level, they're kind of on the borderline. Um, so a good question someone asked, like, I always pressure can them. Can you water bath can them? Yes, there are recipes for both pressure canning and water bath canning. In order to water bath can, though, you do need to add an acid to the tomatoes in order for them to um, to raise the acidity level so they can be water bath canned. So does anybody know what you would add to, to tomatoes to raise that pH or make them more acidic? What do we add? Ah, you guys are nailing it. Tom yes, lemon juice. Yes, that's a very, some recipes say lemon juice or vinegar. Um, I would recommend lemon juice just because it tastes better. Um, I've had canned tomatoes and I've used vinegar before and oh, it was, it was, a, it, they just didn't have as good of a taste. Um, so I recommend lemon juice and store bought and lemon juice is better than fresh squeezed lemons because you are gonna have a constant pH level of that lemon juice from the store versus from lemon to lemon, the pH level can vary. So I do recommend um, using store-bought and lemon juice. Another question on tomatoes is if you want like a chunky garden spaghetti sauce, there's so many different recipes for spaghetti sauce, your own salsa. Um, salsa is tricky because um, if you used a tested recipe, that recipe is tested based on the tomatoes, the pH level of the peppers, the onions. It's specific to that recipe. So you don't want to alter it um, because then you can't, you can't verify that it is actually safe. Um, so what I recommend is make it according to recipe. And if you want more of a chunky spaghetti sauce, add more, add more chunks of tomatoes, peppers, onions when you're cooking it. So when you do, um, open the jar and you're heating it up, add, add that produce then, and that will just make it a little bit more chunky. Or your salsa, if you prefer, prefer a little bit of more um, spice or, you know, add those as you're eating it to when you um, open the jar. So just make sure that it's hard to not get creative and make our own homemade recipes. Um, but unless you haven't tested your recipe, I would make sure that you're following an evidence-based tested recipe. Um, so that is on, so shelf life of preserved tomatoes, again, um, up to 18 months. And how do you know if a recipe is tested? Um, yes, so, and we'll, um, I would worry about, you know, there's a lot of recipes on Pinterest, um, a lot of blogs. I would avoid you, if they don't link to like a USDA or extension websites, um, university, land grant university websites, um, those recipes have not been tested. They're not evidence-based. So I would um, avoid recipes from, oh, my grandma won't like me saying this, but like old, you know, your older church book, cookbooks, um, recipes that have been passed down just because, you know, over the years we have, we've gotten more opportunities and we can test these recipes now. And we know more about the acidity levels to make sure that they are safe. Um, Kansas State received a jar of salsa from someone and they wanted it tested. They wanted to sell it at a farmer's market and it looked great from the outside. And when they opened up, it was like, so, like something was alive and the jar started to grow, the salsa started to grow outside of the jar. Um, and it was just from the mold and bacteria that built up in the pressure in that. And it was not, um, it was not a safe recipe. Um, so just kind of, just take caution and just know where you're getting your recipe from. We love family recipes, um, but instead of canning them, maybe eat them fresh. Eat that, you know, Salsa that doesn't last long in my house. <laughs> All 
All right, Megan, um, I feel like our questions are kind of at a halt um, right now. And I think I covered everything that I wanted to in relation to pressure canning um, right now. But something that I'm, I kind of want to add in is with pressure canning, it's really important to that you can call it a couple of different things. So it's called either exhausting the pressure canner or venting out the pressure canner. So this is something that um, I know my dad wasn't doing, so I wasn't used to doing it until I got trained um, for this position. But when you're pressure canning and you've got your items in your canner and you put the lid on it and your heat, it's on your heating element, you need to vent out your pressure canner. So what this entails is like, if you have a weighted gauge pressure canner, um, you have this port on the lid where you can feel air or hear air kind of exhausting out of it. So eventually as that heat and pressure build up in your canner, um, you'll see steam start um, rushing out of that port and that's what you want to see. So exhausting or venting out your pressure canner is when you start seeing that steam coming out um, in a continuous fashion, you actually set a timer for 10 minutes and you let it vent out for 10 minutes. And what that's doing is it's just getting that cold air out and building up some of that pressure. Um, so I know my dad, he would just like put the weight on it and be like, all right, let's go, let's get to canning. Um, and you don't wanna do that because you might not get all of your jars um, and all of that air um, up to a high enough temperature. So that's something too that a lot of people have learned is that need to vent um, or exhaust out your pressure canner. And again, we have that um, guide to pressure canning and that explains that venting out process as well if there's further questions on that. Otherwise, I think we're ready to move on um, to touching on freezing. So Megan, if you um, want to cover freezing and then I will go over drying yep. when Megan is done. Yes, and I feel like we're just chatty Cathy's here and that I'm looking at the clock and so we will um, cover freezing and drying and we're coming to the end of our hour. Um, but freezing is just another method of food preservation. I personally like to, my two favorite, I like to freeze carrots and we always do corn. Um, my family are farmers and we always go and pick corn cobs and husk and we have this big kind of event of freezing corn. Um, so my freezer is full still right now. But freezing foods, um, it's easy, convenient, takes little time. Um, it can help save us money by reducing food waste. Um, so if you do, if you find something on sale or produce on sale and buy in bulk, you could freeze those foods to make them last longer before they spoil in your fridge. So free freezing um, basically slows the microorganism growth. Um, things to consider before freezing, you know, look at the quality of the produce. You want to make sure it's good quality. Um, chemical changes can happen. So um, there's enzymes and vegetables that are destroyed by heat. So that's why we blanch our vegetables um, to stop that enzyme growth before freezing. Um, there's a lot of different texture changes. So foods may be softer when they're thawed because of the ice crystals. So that may be kind of one offset to freezing certain produce items. Um, another thing to consider is your freezer space. Do you have enough freezer space? Do you know to freeze the produce? Um, and then freezing containers, um, making sure that you have freezer specific bags or containers that are good for um, freezing. Uh, and you always want to practice safe thawing practices. You know, always it's best in the refrigerator for 24 hours. You could do the microwave or sometimes the thawing processes, you're cooking it um, in your recipe. But for best quality and safety, um, thaw your foods in the refrigerator. And on our website, for our, we have the pick it, try it, like it, preserve it um, materials. And they, each of those covers a wide variety of produce. And each of those materials uh, will cover how to freeze. So if you have specific questions on freezing, oh, and Hope just um, picked uh, asparagus as, uh, as an example. So this is one of an example of asparagus. It goes how to pressure can, but also if you wanted to freeze or dry it, it also gives you those options as well.
All right, hope that is all I have for freezing. So anybody should meets meets be blanched before freezing. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> I was getting this stuff going on my computer. It's hard to no, switch back and forth between screens. Um, as far as the meats being blanched, um, that's again going to be another thing where you can either raw pack it or you can hot pack it. So it's going to depend on what meat it is that you're preserving. Are you preserving it with bones or without bones? So Matthew, if you go to um, the canning meats um, article or the canning fish articles that I linked in the chat box, you're going to see a table where it shows you like chicken raw pack, here's how you do it. Chicken hot pack, here's how you do it. Chicken hot pack with bones, here's how you do it. Um, so that should lay it out for you. And those tables actually came from um, the National Center for Home Food Preservation, which is one of the links that I shared um, toward the beginning of this call. So those lay um, canning meats out for you really well um, in the hot, hot packing versus the raw packing of meats. Um, I'm going to so, jump in hope quick. Sorry. Oh, yep. For blanch time, um, Mark and Phyllis had a question on blanch time when you put it in the pot. And that's a great question. I should have covered that. So thank you. So say you're blanching um, green beans and you put it in there. You wait. So you, you put, uh, boil your water, wait to it vigorously boil, put your green beans in there. You want to wait for it to come to a boil before timing it. Um, they uh, also say that if it takes longer than one minute for your boil to return, you have too much produce in your pot. Um, so you want it to come back to a boil fairly quickly. It may just take more times, um, but always wait for that to, um, for blanching vegetables, you want your water to boil again before you um, time it. So great question. Yeah, that was a wonderful question. Thank you, Megan, for filling that in. All right, I'm going to talk really quick on drying so we can get um, to your guys' questions that you might have. So drying is the most easy and simple way to keep food from spoiling, and it can also give you great texture and taste. It's been around for many years, um, and it simply just removes the moisture from the food, um, and then the bacteria, yeast, and mold can't grow because there's no uh, moisture in the product for them to grow, which causes the longer preservation of the food. So um, using dehydrators is a very common style of drying food. Dehydrators produce the best quality of food because they um, have the fan built into them. So they help that heat and airflow continue throughout the drying process. Um, they are able to dry the food uniformly and retain most of the nutrients and food quality. So that's something that's really great. And if you don't have a dehydrator, or don't want to invest in one, you can dehydrate utilizing your oven. Um, it usually takes quite a bit longer than a dehydrator. Um, and I did make, or I did write an article on um, how to be able to extend the life of your produce using your oven. So there's an example of how to dry apples. So sliced apples using your oven. And the tips there is like you putting your oven on low and then putting your sliced apples or whatever produce item that you're wanting to dry on a sheet pan placing that in your oven, you leave your oven ajar, the door ajar about two to four inches, and it takes um, quite a bit of time. So you have to make sure that you have the time and um, the time dedication and the time at home for supervision, which right now might not be a problem for a lot of people. Um, and then they recommend setting a fan outside of your oven just to help with that airflow because fans generally don't have, or ovens generally don't have the fans built into them. Um, so I'll link to that article in the chat box as well. Um, okay, so that's kind of a really quick spiel on drying. Um, I'm going to toss it back over to Megan to kind of touch on our Master Food Preserver program. And then I will close out um, today's session with a few tips. And then we do have a couple of questions that we want to ask you guys. Awesome. All right. And Lisa just said her oven has a dehydrating setting. So I did not know that and that is super fancy and cool. I love it. Uh, I might have to go check my oven now because I haven't paid attention. Um, all right, so the Master Food Preserver Program. It, it, Hope and I are um, launching a pilot program this summer, um, fingers crossed. Um, but it is a certification that people can earn which kind of designates that they have uh, undergone and past training and coursework by Hope and I and learning the most up-to-date methods of food preservations. 
And then these people who are trained are advanced canners, qualified to give advice, and then they act as volunteers for safe home canning. So it's basically a train the trainer course where you come and tr get trained by us and then you act as volunteers and go out into your community or surrounding communities and volunteer to help teach other people how to safely preserve food in their home. So we are piloting that program this summer. Um, it is tentatively set for um, the in-person training is a day and a half and it's tentatively set for July 28th and 29th in Brookings. Um, you would, there will be um, pre you'll have to complete online coursework. So it is a two part. There's some online coursework and also an in-person training. And then, um, then you'll be certified and able to leave, lead workshops across the state. Um, if there's any questions on how to, if you have any more questions on specifics of the program or if you would like to discuss it further or are interested in, in becoming a volunteer in the Master Food Preserver Program, reach out to Hope and I and we would love to have you in. We, if you feel like there's a need and you have a passion for food preservation in your community or surrounding communities, we want you or go tell your friends and families if you know of someone. We would love, um, we would love to help expand this program across the state. Okay, so I'm going to close this out with just a couple of closing tips that I wanted to share with everybody. Um, something that I started doing, I think it was three or four years ago, and um, some people might already do this, but I actually have a specific little notebook that I use to put down notes for um, my gardening and for my canning. So then I've been writing down, you know, I planted this many um, rows of green beans and it was a good year and this is how many jars we were able to can off of that just because, you know, the next year rolls around and maybe other people's memory is better than mine, but I'm like, I have no idea what I did last year and I don't need as many as last year. Um, so it's just a good guide. And then also, um, if I buy fruit off of the fruit, fruit trucks, because that's where I get a lot of my fruit for freezing. Um, so I just make note of how many pounds of blueberries I purchased, and then I record how long it lasted me and my family. So then I know how, if I need to buy more, or if what I had bought the previous year was about right on. Um, there was a question that came in about how to can in their Instant Pot. So I wanted to make the note that you cannot can in your Instant Pot. Um, there is a pressure setting. Um, so some of them are pressure cooking. So that's different than pressure canning. So pressure cooking is when you utilize the pressure to cook the food in your Instant Pot. Um, so that results in really juicy chicken, really tender roasts, um, but you are not able to can in your Instant Pot. And there's some off brands too that say pressure canning instead of pressure cooking, and those are not tested. So we do not recommend them. They don't have the same heat up and cool down time as a pressure canner does. Um, so don't proceed with canning in your Instant Pot. Um, also, I know there was a question on how can you expedite the process of your pressure canner heating up and cooling down so that you can get more batches in in one sitting. Um, and that, and you're not going to like our answer, but our answer is that you can't speed up that process simply because the warm up and cool down time um, that it takes to depressurize your canner that is all part of the evidence-based practice of that tested recipe. So while your jars are cooling down, that's all part of the process of that, um, the molds and bacteria and toxins um, being killed off and naturally letting your jars cool down um, so that they do seal appropriately. So I know that's not the answer you wanted to hear because I wish there was a magical solution and anyone else who pressure cans in large batches um, is in agreement with me. I see a couple of head nods. <laughs> So I know you're right there with me. Um, but yeah, so actually, and this is for water bath canning or pressure canning, when your processing time is up, you are to remove the lid and then you let your jars sit in your canner for five minutes before you take them out. And that just helps with the natural cool down process. And that actually might be where you hear some of um, your pings from your ceiling, the jar ceiling, which is the magical sound that we all like to hear. 
Okay, that is all um, I had for some closing tips. And I know we are right at the end. Um, Lacey is going to put up some questions for you guys. Um, so they're the same questions that you answered at the beginning. And it's just so Megan and I can see if this was helpful, if you feel like you learned anything. So while Lisi gets those pulled up, um, if you have additional questions, you can throw them in the chat box. Otherwise, I do see that Lisi put both mine and Megan's emails so you know how to get a hold of us. We'll give you about 10 more seconds. So I'll let you see them, confident. That's an increase from the beginning. We're gonna to go to the next question in our survey. Launch poll. We'll give you about 25 seconds to do this one. I know your time is important and we want to be respectful. So another five seconds. All right, confident, that's an increase from beginning. Let me share the results real quick, real quickly, because I know we're getting close to being done. And this is our last question. Give you about 20 seconds on this one. Give you another 10 seconds. Gonna end the polling and share the results. We really appreciate your um, time today. Is there any last closing thoughts, it's Megan or Hope? No, this was, we, Thank you so much for joining us. This is, you know, our first session. So we were very pleased with all of you joining and spending the hour with us. And hopefully after this hour, you learn something new and you can take that moving forward. And please feel free to reach out to Hope and I if you have any questions. I'm happy um, preserving. Yeah, yeah. And I just echo everything that Megan said. This was, this was fun. So we hope that you guys enjoyed it too.